very much. Um, pie mash uh, devoured, I hope. Not quite, not quite proper football food, but next time we'll do it with proper pie and mash and, and things like that. Um, welcome back to the panel. Big round of applause as they come onto the, onto the show. Um, and whilst they're coming on, um, if anybody didn't get a flyer or a leaflet, um, they're going to be on the back table. I know some of you came in late, or they went on the seats on the back table um, as, you, as you go out. And also, the Blizzard books that are on the back table are free. So don't feel obliged. Please take them away. I'm sure the guys would be delighted to be uh, that they're going into the right hands. So please take them away. So over to Dave. Thank you very much. I love the first part. Let's have some more. Thank, Thank you. you. Another £20 at the end for saying that. Um, <laughs> and just a warning, uh, what we're going to do in the second half, there were so many people with their hands up, so we'll take the odd thing from Twitter, but I want to take as many questions from you guys as possible. And uh, just if you're asking anything controversial, Macintosh is on his third glass of wine, <laughs> so uh, it might be worth uh, remembering <laughs> that. Um, yeah, uh, guys, can we get right over into the corner there, please, with the microphone? Are the guys with the microphones here? Yeah, right, right over there is someone, please. Sorry to do that to you. The lady over there, yeah. Hi. Guys. Hi. Hi. He's getting there. Better be good. <laughs> no pressure. It is shaved for the occasion, so it's always good. Um, so you were talking about managers mm -hmm. who don't know about anything past the Premier League. As a journalist like yourselves, do you think there's a bit of a arrogance about certain journalists that don't watch any football outside the Premier League? And do you think they should? Because when clubs are buying players, they're turning to Twitter to ask for advice about where this player plays. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, interesting question. Is there an arrogance amongst journalists about you know, players and things like that? Jonathan, an arrogant journalist, whatever next. Uh, you, you go, <laughs> well, you I, go I, first. I certainly haven't met any of them. No. Um, no, I, I think, no, I think maybe if you asked the question five, five ten years ago, there, there, there was a real arrogance, and, and possibly there are some dinosaurs left from, from that era who really don't watch foreign football. Actually, I think most journalists now watch an enormous amount of football. I think you know, you, you've got to bear in mind what a journalist's job is, and it's very easy for, I think I'm right in saying all four of us, we all sort of cover a, a very broad spectrum of, of, uh, of matches, and, and we write on a broad spectrum of, uh, of, um, of topics. But if you're, for instance, um, a national newspaper bloke working in, in the Northeast or in, in the Northwest, then actually it, it's more it's more advantageous for you, it's, it's more relevant to your job to go and watch, stay based in the North East. You actually should be watching Newcastle Reserves, Sunderland Reserves, Middlesbrough Reserves, rather than watching the Bundesliga. For your job is to cover football in that area. And actually, if you have an expertise in the reserve teams of you know, the three major sides in the area, maybe partly Paul Darlington as well, is that your job is to cover that. It's not to cover the Bundesliga. So it's a question of getting the balance right, and, and possibly there's got to be a recognition of of just what a journalist's role is. And it, it's very easy for, for us, who all have quite a privileged position of essentially writing about what we want to write about. We can watch what we want. If your job is to cover an area, you have to cover that area. Ben, what do you make of it? I mean, we had, you know, recently the signing, for example, we could talk about Larry Remy all day, but we won't. Mathieu Debussy, for example, who I, I heard someone say uh, he was brilliant in the Euros, therefore what a great yeah. signing, yeah. which doesn't really bring into account the fact he's been awful for much of the season for Lille so far. I mean, what, what, what do you make Yeah, of I mean, it is a, it is a good point. And I, and I think if, if journalists are guilty of anything, it's probably um, underestimating teams in the championship rather than teams in the top five or eight foreign leagues. Um, I think probably someone like Paul Lambert, who buys a lot of players from the lower divisions in England, um, you know, probably journalists, well, I personally probably wouldn't know the players he signed, Anthony Pilkington is a good example, signed from Huddersfield, has done brilliantly at Norwich. I hadn't heard of him when he signed for Norwich. However, you know, today, for example, I was writing about Brazil and Argentina struggling in the under-20s South American Championship. So, I mean, I'm not sure if any coaches in the Premier League have been following that tournament or um, whether Paul Lambert knows, you know, who the Brazilian centre-backs are on their under-20 side. So I think John is pretty much right. You know, you can only cover so many teams and so many games and I think we all might have a gap in our knowledge but as long as someone is covering it off that's okay and for clubs they just need to fill every gap and some clubs do that much better than others. Ian quickly? Um, yeah the, the, just to back up the point it is actually quite difficult to spread yourself across everything if you think about just the, the mechanics of watching even two games a day, 14 games a week that's still three hours of, um, of, of viewing um, and picking and choosing when 
childcare is in your favour. In, in my case, I can sometimes get to watch a Bundesliga game, a Serie A game, a, a French game, and so on and so forth. Um, however, to deal with the original question, I think there are still some journalists who don't really take into account the relevance of other European leagues, um, particularly when Pep Guardiola left Barcelona, there are a number of national journalists questioning why that was important, when obviously it was very important, it kind of the interconnectedness of the modern game. Um, there are other journalists who, who still you know, pay very little attention. I was at a, a Tottenham PSV game, I think around about 2008, and Jefferson Farfan at that time was, was doing very good things for PSV, and I asked a, a, a more mature journalist if he'd seen much <laughs> about him, and he said, I've never heard of him. I haven't heard of any of these people. I haven't seen them in years. Um, which did kind of, you know, you, you, you thought, God, man, what the hell have you been doing for the past two hours? There's a program there. Um, so that, that you do still get instances of people not really taking the notice. But the way that journalism is going, and something that Jonathan alluded to in the uh, editorial to the most recent issue, is that, um, that, that everything is, is, is splitting. There's more room for, for specialist journalists. There's more room for things like this. So eventually, everyone's going to have to up their game. Uh, okay. Including Thank me, sadly. No, well, yeah, there you go. It comes to all of us, Living. I suppose. There's a gentleman at the back there with a the gentleman in the blue sweater at the back, if you can... Uh, Get over to him, and I'll come to you. Uh, you next, yeah. Uh, famously, uh, Xavi once felt he was almost on the scrap heap uh, as an archetype, as a kind of creative, not particularly athletic, box-to-box -box type midfielder. Uh, and also, conversely, you have the likes of Michael Owen, uh, who seemed to have the world at his feet at one point, but then the game left him behind in terms of tactical prog progression. Uh, are there? As a panel of esteemed journalists about who know an awful lot about football tactics, do you foresee in, in the next 10 years or so any particular archetype becoming more successful or any becoming obsolete? OK, Philippe, uh, you go first of all. <laughs> Firstly, is it fair, is it fair <laughs> to say Michael, well, Michael Owen got pretty badly injured, didn't he? As well, I mean, uh, apart yes. from just becoming obsolete tactically. But, yeah, I mean, I take the... No, no, he, he, he just got to, injured. The problem just just to stick up for him for a second. The, not the, that I like the, doing The it. problem with him is that he was over, overplayed at yeah. a very young age. And he was a very... He was described, I remember, at one point as the oldest 23-year-old on the yeah. planet. Yeah. And um, which was probably about fair. And that's because of that. But I wouldn't say that uh, Michael Owen, as he was in 2001, is not obsolete. He would never yeah. be obsolete. There's absolutely... I think I'm, Macaulay Culkin might have a thing or two to say no, about that. No, anyway, I'm... Um, I'm yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> continue, Ian. Um, <laughs> continue about the. Uh, you no, know, I mean, I, I, it's, no, it, it's not the kind of question. Honestly, I hadn't thought about it. The new type of player. Uh, I'm, I'm taking. A bit Would you like me to come back to you? Well, I don't. I'll come I'm back taking to you, Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, go on. Go, yeah. Because well, I'm, if I can direct you to the piece I wrote in the Guardian today. <laughs> oh um, God Almighty! I, uh, the point I was making there was that 43-1 uh, when it sort of. I mean, it grew up in Spain in the 90s, and it, it's had become almost a, a universal default of the place 442 as being the bog standard formation for the world by, I guess, year 2008. Uh, and we start to see a, a you know, change to that. And one of the things that 4231, I think, did very effectively was that the, the wide players block in the fullbacks, which in 442, uh, Jack Charlton observed it in 1994, and everybody ignored him, but it, it's, you know, it's absolutely true. If 442 plays 442, the people with time and space are the fullbacks. So we've seen, I think, in the last. 10, 20 years, the fullback has become incredibly important. I'm not saying the most important player on the pitch, but tactically, hugely important, way more important than he was previously. Now, if he is now blocked in, as, as a 4-3-3-1 or a 4-3-3 tends to do, you know, the, uh, he either has to deal with the winger from an attacking point of view, or the winger is, is closing him down, then where is the space? Now, if you have a single central striker, as you do in a 4-3-3-1 or a 4-3-3, the formations that allow you to play the wide men high, then you have two centre backs playing against one centre forward. So that means one of your centre backs is spare. Yeah. Now, if he can come out with the ball, if I mean, I guess it's it's not particularly different to say how how Beckenbauer played. It's a it's a reinterpretation of that role. You can make a case that <laughs> when when Mascherano plays there for the Barcelona, certainly when Busquets has played at centre back for Barcelona, even Piquet for Barcelona, the, the the comfort on the ball, being able to bring the ball out from the back is hugely important. My suspicion, and it's, it's a guess, I'm not saying it definitely will happen, but my, my suspicion is that type of player, the, the, the ball-playing centre-back, the player who's the centre-back who's comfortable with the ball at his feet, Jan Vertonghen at, at Tottenham, I think, is a great example. On the odd occasion, he has played centre-back rather than left-back. That, that, I think, is a, is a position and a, a, um, an interpretation of the role of centre-back we'll, we'll, 
see becoming increasingly common. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, Tony Cascarino uh, said that in, 30, in his column in the Times, in 30 years' time, there won't be centre backs. Not as we know them now. They'll be all be ball players, and that's the way he feels. And there's several coaches in Italy, aren't there, who are uh, playing people like Angelo Palombo, who's playing uh, centre half for Sampdoria now, all converting oh, the field. Uh, De Rossi all, playing. De Rossi played, but although not this season. But yeah. well, Zeman doesn't play well, with centre yeah. halves anyway. But um, but Philippe, you know, your thoughts. It's a valid point Jonathan makes, isn't it? I, I know, but I'm I'm very loath to make any predictions. Yeah. Um, very loath. I mean, because I'm preparing a piece on the Blizzard, which is um, yes, about about the demise uh, of the centre about obsolescence. Yeah. Of, of tactics and obsolescence of, of players' roles, and I compare that to uh, what's happened in chess, uh, which is uh, one of my favorite sports. It mm -hmm. is a sport. And you can take from one sport something, that you can export it to another sport, and the fact is that all the predictions that have been made about the future of chess have been shown to be wrong. And there is no more strategically and tactically minded uh, game as, as chess is. And I. I'd, I'm, I'm turning that into a question. How many of the tactical changes and evolutions which have happened over the last 10 years, shall we say, could you have predicted? So, uh, yes. Well, I mean, I think strikelessness, you, you could predict, and Carlos Alberto Primera did predict it in 2003. Um, well, the strikerlessness, I mean, is it really a strikerlessness or just a player who has got different attributes who is playing in a striker's position? Well, which is what Fabregas would say, for example. Yeah, but, but, but there's a difference between how Messi plays well and how Fabregas plays well. I, I totally True. agree yeah. with you that Fabregas is a midfielder playing a centre forward. Messi is a centre forward who drops off. I don't think we're necessarily coming any close to answering the original yeah, sorry, question. Yeah, yeah. So, and it is about questions from the audience, not yeah. from you. So uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's enough of that. So, uh, in fact, the gentleman at the back that I initially pointed out with the uh, the, the light blue jumper on, if you could, uh, you had your hand up for ages. Sorry. Um, is £62 too much to pay for a ticket in the Premier League these days? Well, some assistant referees think so, don't they, clearly? <laughs> um, firstly, Ian, what, what are your thoughts on that particular assistant referee being taken off his game this week? Well, he got throwed bastards. probably a leading question. Throwed bastards like that in the dungeon, keep him away from other human beings. He can't <laughs> yeah. have stuff like that, showing emotions and humanity. Yeah, they realise this is a serious game. No place for it, is there? Absolutely no not. Uh, part of me, w when I first heard about it, was it's not really his place. It was a bit kind of... A bit matey, wasn't it? A bit supply teachery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a bit weird. Um, but <laughs> but it, it wasn't a terrible thing he did. He did not do a bad thing. And it would have been wiser just for them to take him aside. And it's probably best to stay out of that and just wave your wee flag and, you know, the world will move on. And, and uh, But, you know, hauling him off just seems a bit harsh. Yeah, the lines were there, Mr Smith, but you can call me Graham, kids, yeah. Um, <laughs> ben... John ben, Brooks, yes. John Brooks, yeah. yeah. Um, ben, £62 too much to pay for a football match? Uh, well, yes, but, you know, people are going to pay it. And so if the, if the supply is there, I mean, if the market is there, the demand is there, they, they will, if they can fill their seats, they do, it doesn't really matter, unfortunately. <laughs> but fundamentally, um, the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it is too much, uh, yeah, certainly. And, and especially as you rarely go on your own to a game. So it's actually... If you're a family, it becomes, you know, 124. If you go with your, your son or your daughter or whoever it is or your mate, you know, it becomes, it becomes more. It's very rarely, un, you know, not just £62, it's the extras as well. I thought you did go on your own, actually, quite a lot. Jo Jonathan, uh, what well, are your thoughts? I, I find it quite, quite difficult to answer because uh, to what extent does a club have a responsibility to its audience beyond that? I mean, say, say a, a theatre was charging £62 for tickets for something that's a sellout. Would we query that much? Yeah, we you would. It's going to be good, or, or at least you have a, mm. an idea of what it's going to be. You could pay sixty-two pounds and, and see total dross, which I think you know is what, what yeah, fans yeah. at the Emirates have been worrying well, about. But, this yeah, but, but, <laughs> but I mean, the point is, it, the price is set by the market. So, I, but I think a football club actually does have a responsibility to its community. So, I, I guess what the, what actually needs to be is a sliding scale that you release a certain amount of tickets um, for, you know, at, at a low cost that you try and aim at. The traditional fan, for want of a better term, um, and, and you know that, that that slides upwards, and then so maybe actually have a greater range of price rather than just greater prices. So you have some tickets for for twenty pounds and some for two hundred pounds. If people are prepared to pay two hundred pounds, I'm sure football clubs are, are quite happy to take that cash. Yeah, I mean, Philip, quickly, the, the model that's always brought out is the Bundesliga. You know, when you watch a you, can, you watch it started, you watch an <laughs> Augsburg game or a Greater Furt game, and it's packed. Well, you Absolutely don't want to watch Greater Furt game. Right. They're really no, no, crap. no. Okay, they're really crap. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing uh, is that there, there, there are an awful lot of myths circulating around the Bundesliga um, and it's very easy to angelize them and to demonize the Premier League and the fact that Arsenal were singled out I thought it was 
quite scandalous, I must say. Uh, that was me, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, amongst other people. Uh, there are a number of other clubs which provide facilities which have got nothing to do with what Arsenal Football Club, which is a self-sustaining club, is providing while charging just as much for away, tra away fans. The big problem is that away fans, as we all know, are the ones who make the noise, are one, the ones who actually create an atmosphere within the ground, and that, yes, you have to look at pricing models which enable away fans taking into account the amount of money they're going to spend on the train, the bus, the car, whatever and to, to make it affordable. To single out Arsenal for that was, I think, absolutely ludicrous. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, if you talk about the Bundesliga, if you go to the Allianz Arena, you will see that, yes, you've got the guys who are in the cheap, in the cheap seats behind the goal with, by the way, a net so that they can't throw things onto the pitch. Then you realize that the people who are uh, sitting with you uh, uh, in, in the posher seats, they're paying just as much as Arsenal, Manchester City, or, by the way, Spanish football fans who are the ones who pay the, the highest amount of money in any league in the world. 71 euros is the average price of a ticket in Spain, in La Liga, in a country that is stricken by an economic crisis of which we have no idea here. 71 euros. So I think that the, the debate is slightly skewed. To okay, say the least. okay. I, I would point out that just the reporting of fact isn't necessarily scandalous. They, they didn't make up the figures. No, well, you, might, you, well, you know, you can have well, your arguments about no, singling them a lot out, was made out. A lot was made out of it as if it was so, an exceptional occurrence. It is not. Uh, if you want to go in and watch Fulham at Fulham, if you want to go and watch City at City or even Wigan, uh, if you want to watch Wigan at, at, at the DW uh, Stadium, the away fan will pay two or three times more than the guy who's got the season ticket at, at Wigan Athletic. Okay, and that's okay, a fact. Fine. I'll come to you in a second, but I realise I haven't spun and turned to that gentleman there. I, I'll come to you in a second. Um, I was going to uh, financial fair play. It's going to be coming in, I think, from next season. Yes. But um, I mean, you still see teams like PSG, Man City, who've been racking up massive losses over the last couple of years, and they're still being linked regularly with 40, 50 million pound players. I mean, how um, effectively is this going to be enforced? And by extension, how seriously are clubs actually taking fa financial fair play? Okay. Yeah. Question about financial fair play. If we can keep this one quite quick because we did do this one as well at the, uh, the Blizzard at Wembley, N not, not that that's your fault at all. Um, ben, what about financial fair play? Because at the moment it doesn't seem to exist, you know, no, no one seems to be even thinking about it, do they? Well, I think they are thinking about it. I mean, Arsenal are certainly thinking about it because they're totally compliant, um, and I think United are as well, and City are trying to find ways around it. I mean, the big test will come when a club fails all the financial fair play uh, regulations that are in place, and what does UEFA do? Now, what they've done with Malaga is ban them from their, from their next uh, qualification for European competition if it happens any time in the next four years. And that is a kind of, it's a shot across the bows really to say we are watching clubs. That, that was for um, failure to pay players on time, wasn't it, um, from last season. And that's basically saying, you know, we are watching you and we will take action. But Malaga, this is their first season in the Champions League. They are not a big club. You know, if it was Barcelona or Real Madrid, I doubt they would take that kind of action. And that's <laughs> where the, the testing ground comes, I think, for the next three or four years. We will see if um, PSG signed Ronaldo uh, to play alongside Zlatan uh, for 60 million euros or whatever it is. They'll clearly be in breach of FFP. What will UEFA do? Um, PSG, also you know, one of the biggest clubs in France, but not a huge pedigree in the Champions League. Will PSG walk away from the Champions League? Well, probably not. But will they try and find a way uh, to get around it? You know, that that's, is basically where the challenge comes. And I think no one quite knows what's going to happen. But the Malaga thing is quite interesting because it's UEFA saying, we are watching you. But, you know, whether they'd kick out Real Madrid, I mean, really? Champions League without Real Madrid? I mean, How does that sound from a, from a selling TV right, rights point of view, from UEFA's point of view? It's difficult. Just finally on this, that's the point, though, Philippe, isn't it? A law or a ruling is only about how it's implemented. And well, unless they actually chuck out someone from the quarterfinals of the Champions League at some point, it it's kind of doesn't it matter, will, does it? It, won't, it won't happen. <coughs> okay. And the other thing is I will qualify. I mean, Ben is right in as, in as much the UEFA is using things like Malaga as they used Mallorca in the past, or Atletico de Madrid uh, as well. But this has got nothing to do with the financial fair play regulations, it's just the strict application of regulations which have been in place for a very long time, nothing to do with the regulations kicking on from 2013, 14 onwards. 
uh, I have absolutely no doubt none of the big guys will be ever kicked out of the Champions League. OK, brilliant. And uh, I'll take I, a bet on that. I'm going to take a couple more questions in just a second and, and loads more. But after a question about financial fair play, I always feel like a bit of light relief, um, so <laughs> to speak. Um, Gareth, Twitter, anything, anything there about snow or otherwise? Uh, we've not got any snow, but uh, if you want some light relief for the panel, in your years of covering football, which ground has the best press box and media centre buffet that you've ever experienced? <laughs> uh, sounds like a question for Macintosh. <laughs> Uh, best press box is Arsenal. It's like watching football in a five-star hotel. It's ridiculous. You have a tiny little TV screen on your desk. Um, they'll supply wires to get you um, online. The press lounge is unbelievable. You have like 70 or 80 individual booths and plugs and a free bar and, and you know, pan-fried um, sea bass and all sorts of things. But Chelsea, the buffet there, I'm telling you, that's where your ticket money's going. <laughs> <laughs> Last game I was there, the Swansea game, they had squid and chorizo salad. They had tartlets. Tartlets. <laughs> the free bar. And giant jars of M&Ms and jelly babies. It was amazing. You don't even need to go and watch the game. I go there just to eat. <laughs> Fantastic. OK. Everyone pretty much concur with that? Chelsea. 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 By, I mean, Chelsea and Manchester City are, are close contenders, but the buffet uh, at, um, at Chelsea is, has become mythical. <laughs> and you should, see, you should see the faces of the guys, Ukrainian journalists who went to see uh, Cheka Donetsk last season. They've never seen anything like I, it. I've got to say, I, <laughs> never. I've, I've just spent two and a half years in the North East, and it's a You've wonderful... You've forgotten the grilled asparagus oh, out of season. Asparagus. The little individual the pots, pots, of pots, the oh, pots of rillettes. The pots of rillettes. Duck Astounding. I've just spent two and a half years and living the in... the white wine is called Fernando. Right. That's odd. There's a million <laughs> jokes. <laughs> and, and, so finally from you? Uh, yeah, just, just to say that I've been in the North East for two and a half years. Lovely part of the world, wonderful people. But to come from there where the pre-match meal is an undisclosed meat curry. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of curry is that? Meat. <laughs> <laughs> to Chelsea is just the most wonderful thing. But I think it's actually a, a semi-serious point. This doesn't involve Gary Bennett, does it? No. No, well, oh, okay. <laughs> no. no OK, carry on. I, I could have worked in him and I shan't. Um, <laughs> Arsenal used to have the best food. It used to be sensational. Um, and it's, it's Chelsea have outstripped them. Arsenal have fallen behind. I think they've become complacent. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <coughs> I, I, I think the, the, the work in the market is perhaps you know, not what it used to be. Um, but bringing up chefs from the academy rather than investing <laughs> in <laughs> quality. Quite. So, yeah, Chelsea, definitely. But in terms of pre best press box, which is a slightly different question, I think the Amsterdam Arena is fantastic. You're really high up. You can look down the pitch. You can see the shape much better. Uh, I think Arsenal, I'm, I'm nitpicking ridiculously, the, the press box below the seat is incredibly comfortable, although you do have a personal TV and wires. You're a little bit low. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to move on from this. I, I would like to big up the Ennio Tardini in Parma, which serves uh, from that town, of course, Parmesan and Parma ham at halftime and nothing else, which is great, and the Renzo Barbera in Palermo, which at which halftime espresso served by beautiful women to all the media. Like, <laughs> descended upon by ten different Eau Claire's on the next flight. <laughs> anyway, the, um, <laughs> the gentleman over there, yeah, really. Uh, yeah, as a, as a Crystal Palace fan, I've become used to seeing some of our best young players leave over the years with varying degrees of success. We've had Moses doing very well at uh, Wigan and Chelsea, and then obviously the John Bostock case where it didn't go quite so right at Tottenham. Uh, we look set to lose another one in January or the summer. And my question for the panel is, uh, is there a case to be made for biding your time and learning your game at the lower levels, or should a young, ambitious footballer uh, do everything they can to play at the highest level as soon as they can? So what do you think, Ian? Will Wilfred Tarr spend another couple of years learning his trade, or should he go to Manchester United? I think United? the second half of this season and the pressure of a, a, a chase for promotion will probably do him the world of good, certainly more uh, a world of good than sitting on the bench somewhere. Um, but, yeah, as, as your man says, there's uh, the count of Johnny Bostock's just vanished. Wayne Routledge spent about five years in the wilderness before finally working his way back in at Swansea. You, you need game time, not just for, for honing your technique, but, but for the mentality um, and for the mental strength. And Jonathan, an incredible amount of young players who, for want of a better word, have been promoted too early, have then dropped back down and done really well and got a, got a second chance. Sebastian Jovinko would be, would be one, yeah. for example, and there are many examples. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, this question kind of, I guess, recurs all over the place. I mean, you see I mean, young players leaving, say, Serbia very early, um, probably too early, and then struggling to, to adapt. But, I mean, I, I think it is a real issue that if you look at how many players have wasted parts of their career at, at, 
I'm going to I'm going to use Chelsea as an example because I'm thinking lots, think lots of examples, but yeah, I'm sure there are other clubs as well. I mean, people like Steve Sidwell, uh, Sean Wright Phillips, um, Scott, Scott Sinclair. Well, he's now wasting his time at a different yeah, he's club. Yeah, done it again. Um, yeah. Even Daniel Sturridge. I mean, Daniel Sturridge, by the age of 23, had played 48 times in the Premier League. Now, by that age, Lionel Messi had scored 200 odd goals in La Liga. Now, I'm not suggesting Sturridge would have been as good a player as Messi, but he'd be a lot better player for having <coughs> played matches. So, I, I think you know, there's, a, there's a bizarre thing that if you're there's a, there's a friend of mine actually whose, whose son is eight and is um, apparently quite good at football and has, has attracted interest from clubs, and he was saying to me, "Where should he go?" And I was saying, "Well, I mean, a, don't ask me, but b." Um, don't go to a big club because you actually, if you come through the academy of a big club, just waste the first two or three years of your career unless you are absolutely exceptional. I mean, one of the you know best five, seventeen-year-olds in the world or something. You're not going to get a game at Chelsea or at, or at City. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a big problem with kind of youth talent being stockpiled at big clubs so, and not going again. So to sum up, Zaha should stay for as long as he can, a couple yeah. of years at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so hopefully for you, he will. Yeah, fingers crossed. Sorry, Philip, we're going to move on. Uh, gentleman, there, you've been waiting for ages, and then the gentleman. Uh, sorry, Philip. It's all right. Your gentleman there, yeah. Uh, I I just wanted to ask a question about the politics of FIFA. Um, now that keep it light. Uh, <laughs> Blatter is obviously has made his case that he's going to go into punditry, so I'm sure you're all quaking in your boots. But uh, what what do you think the future of FIFA is going to look like? Do you think Blatter will step away in 2015? Do you think Platini is the white knight that everyone expects? What will happen with all the Piet and Garcia reforms? I just do you th do you see a bright future or? Not really. Philippe, do you see a bright future? You're, you're the perfect one for this. Thank you for the question. I, I can only talk off the record about this one. Really? So no, do you, do you, uh, you, can, you can answer, do you see a bright future for FIFA, which is the question, can't you? Yes, I, can I say, well, the, the, the present is very bright for, right. for FIFA. They've got £740 million pounds, uh, as cash reserves, I believe, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, <laughs> no, I am actually serious when I say that, uh, and, and I, w I would be the devil's advocate for one second, you know, which anybody who's, anybody who's read my platini piece in, uh, in the blizzard would be quite surprised by it, but um, if you look at the role of FIFA, from if you take a step back and if you look at the way the game has evolved uh, since uh, Blatter was elected in June 1998 um, and since he became actually a very important person there in 1981 most of what has happened has been for the good of the game and I know that sounds incredible to say that but the game was bankrupt at international level um, there was the introduction of uh, the prohibition of the uh, back pass rule uh, the, prohibit the red card offence as tackled from behind. And you look at the women's game, the way it's progressed, the fact that the World Cup has gone to, to Africa, you could carry on like that an awful lot. And I think this is one side of the debate about FIFA that people are completely missing out. It's very easy to get, as I do, uh, to home on the corruption and, and all that is supposed to have happened and to forget about the bigger picture. So is there a bright future for FIFA? Yes, I do think there is, indeed. Is Platini the white knight? No, I don't think so. And we'll talk about it when this is over and the camera have stopped. Really. OK, so there you go. A glass of wine with him, he'll tell you all. Uh, Ian, um, say something funny about FIFA. <laughs> <laughs> Set blatter. Yeah, there you go. Um, no, I think I, I, I do take on board what, what you're saying. Um, you're certainly far more knowledgeable than me on this, but all I can see is a war coming, um, and it will come over Qatar and their insane decision to try and stage it in blazing hot temperatures. And uh, I think Karl-Heinz Rummenigge will be gathering his forces from the European Football Club Association and preparing for battle, because if they send his players out there in 50 degree temperatures, I think there's probably going to be a little bit of opposition. Yeah, there's a war the coming, which sounds suitably dramatic. Which is, there was someone just behind you who wanted to ask a question as well. So, if you're still there. Hi. Um, Ben mentioned right at the beginning that uh, Manchester City and Chelsea uh, were the biggest spenders uh, on analytics, but that hasn't resulted in um, great success in the Champions League, at least. And I was wondering um, if the panel uh, knew how clubs are using analytics, how receptive managers and players are to them, and what, what changes that's having in the way football's played, the way tactics are used. OK, I don't know how much you can say, but there's only one person to answer this, well, which is I, Ben, of course. I mean, I can't say some, some things, but I should declare an interest because I work for a company called Soconomics, which is based on um, the book of the same name. We basically set up as a consultancy business. Uh, the book it explains how uh, data analysis can 
improve performance and um, save money for clubs. And we have, as part of that business, approached clubs and we work with clubs to help them in this arena. So I do know a bit about it. Um, and, you know, as I said at the beginning, it, it, there is so much information and data out there and clubs are still trying to work out what the best data um, is. I mean, this is something that Sam Allardyce was doing at Bolton 10, 12 years ago, and, he, you know, he would look at stats of um, completed passes in the final third, which is quite an important metric, uh, depending on the way you play. But he would see that Gary Speed had an amazing um, rating in that bracket, and that was really important to him. So wherever he went, Speed went with him, or Speed you know, was a hugely valuable player to him at Bolton, so he kept on offering him a new contract and proved to be you know, a really good signing. The same, same is true of Kevin Nolan, who you probably wouldn't think is uh, a particularly special player, but you know, he always has a fantastic job for Sam Allardyce at Bolton, at Newcastle, and now at West Ham. He is a kind of player that the data backs. So you know, if you went to your chairman and said, I want to buy Kevin Nolan, because you know, even though he's 32 and he's all right, um, you know, I want to sp spend two million on him and I want to give him this much money per year. Uh, you can go to your chairman now, or Allardyce would, and say, because he touches the ball this many times in the final third and he will get on the end of this many chances and he'll create this many chances. And it does help. And it helps Nolan negotiate a contract and it helps them work out their salary package and all these kind of things. And they're using it much more. And Allardyce, interestingly, was at the forefront of this in England and now is seen, something of a, is seen as a bit of a dinosaur <laughs> because part of the guys that he worked with um, his backroom team at Bolton were Mike Ford and Gavin Fleek, who are now the performance directors at Chelsea and Man City, uh, respectively, are you know, leading a new wave of data analysis, which is very heavily based on what they're doing in America with um, NBA and NFL analysis and the baseball stuff that Simon was talking about earlier. You know, it, it, it's all tied in, and we know that Liverpool brought in Damian Connolly on the back of Billy Bean's recommendation to do a moneyball type thing, which blatantly didn't work but then you could argue that it did work because they sold Fernando Torres for 50 million now they also you know totally wasted that 50 million but you know the idea of selling Torres was based on those concepts they looked at the data and realized that after he had an operation in I think it was um, March or April of 2010 to make the World Cup they realized that his level had totally dropped and that it was a good time to sell him so you know Liverpool <coughs> did use data in their favor then and then they just you know, signed Andy Carroll. And then they signed Andy Carroll. <coughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process, and, and some coaches are really into it, and some coaches are not into it. Um, but I think as in time, it will become much more important okay. when people know how successful it can be. OK, you can continue that conversation yeah. afterwards as well. Well, just to let you know, we're into Fergie time, so uh, I'll try and get as many quick questions in as possible. So you, sir. You, yes, right there, if they want to bring the microphone. Do you think that the media can play a role and journalists like yourselves can play a role in sort of getting away from this culture that we have in this country of blaming the referee for every little thing that goes wrong? Okay, uh, Philippe, big sigh. Yes, uh, yes, I do think we have got a huge role and it starts by not asking the question at the press conferences and if the manager starts to talk about it, just completely shunt it. That's a very quick answer. Okay, would it help if the referee spoke uh, after games? Possibly, but I mean, it hugely frustrates me. It's just a, it's a tactic of avoiding the issue. You know, um, take the the Arsenal City game. Was that a red card for Koscielny? Yeah, it's borderline it's a cynical foul in the box. You can't really have sympathy. Was it actually a clear goal scoring opportunity? That's debatable. I think a red was right. I think a yellow would have been right. I don't have a problem between those two. Actually, the issue is why did Koscielny? Why did he let Jacko get goal side of him? Why was the balls played through? Did he then panic and, and haul him down? So. Yeah, th those are the things that Arsene Wenger can, can deal with. He can get Koscielny to stay on the right side and not to panic. Maybe he can't get him not to panic, but it, at least he can work on that. Whereas the referee's made a decision, it's gone, you can't do anything about that. So it's just a way of skipping the issue. So I think actually managers should avoid that. And sh but surely the bigger issue in that game was the other red card, wasn't it? You know, in terms of the media are right to talk about the other red card in that game, weren't they? The company well, one? Well, the media are always right to talk about any event. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> however, there is an innate laziness sometimes in just picking the referee decision and making that your key angle to go with. Because, you know, we've, we've all got deadlines. We've all got to churn out 800 words five minutes before the full-time whistle. And so there is a responsibility on journalists um, and, and, and on managers. And, and, you know, it wouldn't hurt if we all did a refereeing course and maybe did one game. 
and then went back out and did our jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let us all know when you're doing yours. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think I might enjoy that. There are some qualified referees in the press court, yeah. by the way. Alison yeah. Rudd. Alison Rudd and Glenn Moore, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, the media was interestingly split about the company red card, which is because people have to sort of make their own decision and set it off for their deadline. It was a, one of those rare examples when it was split. It, just on the panel quickly, did, the company red card, was it yes or no? Was it a red, do you think? Would you have sent him off? No. No. No, no, no. no. Borderline probably. Yeah, I thought you were going to say yes. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, I'm saying no, but yeah. borderline. I can understand why it was red. Yeah, interesting. It was, it was one of those. So, any more questions, folks? Yes, you there. Sorry, the chap over there in the middle, just to make it awkward for you with the microphone. And I'll get you in as well. We've got a, a reasonably unique situation at Watford at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Watford were purchased by the Pozzo family in the summer, who also own Udinese in Syria and uh, Granada yes. in La Liga. Um, I'm interested to know if the panel think that um, the subsequent amount of loan signings Watford have made, I think it's 12 they have at the moment, gives them an unfair advantage over their competition, or that given the financial stability that's now bought the club, it's something that should be encouraged for other clubs in the future. Yeah, Jonathan, what do you think of the, the Pozzos at Watford, and it, as you say, indeed Granada as well? Yeah, well I mean, to, to be honest, it surprised me slightly how well it has gone at Watford, because my, my instinct with it, when you have... I think loan signings basically should be to plug gaps. You know, if, if, you, if you desperately need a centre-forward, and if, for instance, when Bolton got Sturridge in, yeah, that was clearly plugging a gap. Uh, I think if you make loan signings your your sort of basic way of doing business, you, you, you fill your team with loan signings, then you, inevitably those those players don't have any great commitment to the club. If things are going badly, are they really going to going to bust a gut for, for, for that team? And I think Doncaster last season is a great example of that. That a whole load of loan signings who basically looked at each other and went. Um, so it, it's. I, my, my, my question had actually been the exact reverse of that. I, I, my question would have been, are loan signings bad for Watford? As it turns out, they've, they've been quite good. But I think it's an, an unhealthy situation, uh, and I, I suspect that actually the right thing to do is put a limit on the number of loan, loan signings any team can have. Yeah, brilliant uh, impression of Al Hadjif as well there. Um, Philippe, <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on this? I, I was going to yeah. conclude on exactly what uh, I think what one of the better challenges would be the uh, limitation on, on loan moves. Uh, also, what is disturbing me is that you see networks starting to grow in Europe <coughs> where clubs completely lose their identity to become feeder clubs. Royal Antwerp, which is a great European club, has completely lost its identity because of its relationship with Manchester United. Um, we had uh, the example recently of another uh, Belgian club which was bought on by, by the Qataris and participation, which is now a feeder club. And you could carry that the relationship, I would even go further. Uh, that some um, um, European clubs have got with African clubs. Uh, we want clubs to have their own identity, so please let's cap the number of loans. Okay, uh, you sir. Um, if you were the uh, god of all football, what would be the Which one? Which Jonathan is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the uh, one change you would make? Okay, the one change to football. There you go. Uh, ben, first of all. Um, I like the idea of getting managers to play as substitutes, just come on for the last 10 minutes <laughs> of games. So the team that has Roberto Mancini or Michael Laudrup on the bench actually has an advantage <laughs> over the team that has Arsene Wenger. He probably can't even move in his sleeping bag. Um, although John's team, Sunderland, would do quite well because Martin O'Neill is always suited up for the game. He wears his tracksuit and he's got his boots ready to go. Yeah, Owen Coyle um, has suddenly come back in the fashion. Yeah, exa shorts. exactly. Yeah, Rafa, so Rafa coming on would be great. Oh, wouldn't you just love to see these? I'd love yeah. to see Arsene Wenger just try and play football. I mean, it'd be really interesting. He was, he was French champion. Yes, with Strasbourg, Strasbourg yeah, absolutely. There you go. You okay, uh, Jonathan, yeah. your, your change to football um, as the god. I think the, th and the thing that most annoys me in football is time wasting, which might be a, a, a tiny thing, but uh, you know, I, I go to the Cup of Nations yeah, every two years, every, every year, as it turns out, the menace. And it's, <laughs> it's particularly, it seems particularly prevalent there, and particularly among North African teams. And certainly the, the Algeria Ivory Coast quarter final from 2010 where I actually timed extra time how much the ball was in play and it was slightly under seven minutes because of time wasting. So I would say to, to combat that I'd say no more than one sub per team in the last ten minutes of a game. Uh, basically it's only for injuries because uh, if, if it's a tactical substitution you need to have made it earlier. I'd say if you actually require treatment from a, a physio that you have to go off for a minimum of three minutes. If you can hobble at the touchline that's fine, it's not a problem. But if you're so badly injured you need somebody to come on and kind of carry you off. It's going to take at least three minutes to put you right. Um, and uh, by fact, those two things. OK, Philippe? Um, one thing that irritates me, you know, all, I mean, more every game, because I see it in every game, I would love, once the referee has blown his whistle for a free kick or for when the ball has got into touch, 
that the side that has conceded the free kick or conceded the touch doesn't have the right to touch the ball, kick it away, hand it, you know, doing this uh, passing on uh, above the head, and it's an automatic yellow card offence. Again, that's time wasting and speeding up the tempo of the game. Okay, talking of time wasting, I'm really sorry, and I've neglected this side of the room because I've been told we've run out of time. Um, so it's going to be down to McIntosh finally. My change would be I'd put Zdenek Zeman in charge of football <laughs> and make everyone play the way that he wants to play, and every game would finish 8 6 and it would be ace. And I'd never get bored of it, and you would hate it. Yeah. You? you like a nil nil draw. Um, so finally, no pressure at all on, uh, on you, McIntosh, but the final uh, answer from the panel you were here to keep it light. What would you change in football? <laughs> uh, two things, either um, hugely draconian powers for referees to uh, belittle and bully footballers in, uh, in moments of dissent, <laughs> like proper slaps across the face for back chat, that kind of thing, or uh, extra time multi-tigers, where one tiger is released on the pitch at the end of 90 minutes uh, to, to limit the numbers and open up more space. Excellent, fantastic. What a place to finish, extra time multi-tigers. It doesn't get, um, it sounds like one of sporting indexes, more obscure markets, that, but it doesn't get uh, much better than that. Listen, thanks very much indeed to, uh, to Bloomberg for having us. Uh, it's been much appreciated. Uh, thanks, of course, to the panel. Thanks to you for coming. And I should name check them one final time. So thanks to Philippe Claire, to Ben Littleton, to Ian McIntosh, to Jonathan Wilson, and uh, from Ido Farr as well. Uh, goodbye and thanks so much for coming. <clears throat>